Hi everybody, I'm Ralph ben Mergi. Welcome to my podcast, Not That Kind of Rabbi. Now, let's be clear, I'm not actually a rabbi, which is why I'm not that kind of rabbi as well. Uh, I am looking at everything through a spiritual lens and asking people to join me in that conversation. Uh, I want to start off with a piece of music. I've got this one. It's from the Kabbalah Dream Orchestra. It's called Avinu Malkenu. It's pretty trippy. Avinu Malkenu from the Kabbalah Dream Orchestra. You get to hear that one on the holiest day of the year in Judaism. Yom Kippur. Avinu Malkenu is usually done much slower without that backbeat. So I really wanted to play it for you. Now, on this particular episode, I have a dear friend and somebody who I've always wanted to have this conversation with. And uh, we're calling this one, I Believe in Golf. And... It is apparently a religion, and apparently there are disciples and godlike figures and saints and shrines and green jackets and (laughs) all that kind of stuff. So I figured Mr. Howard Glassman, otherwise known as Humble Howard from Humble and Fred. A.K.A. Golf Spiritual Leader. Golf Spiritual Leader. This is what I call myself on on my golf podcast. I refer to myself as GSL. Golf spiritual leader. Okay, perfect. So, okay, let's get into the religion of golf. First of all, thank you. Uh, I've been a fan of your work since uh, you introduced me on uh, the amateur night in Winnipeg. It was a Wednesday. I was uh, working at Yuck. I think it was Yuck Yucks in Winnipeg. Yes, and you came on, and I'd heard of you, but at first I was somewhat irritated. 
As a, as was I. As you as, as first we, <laughs> That's right. In fact, it was uh, there was a lot of irritation. Well, Howard kept telling for me a how long much time, time I had because yes. I, I was hosting and he was yes. going to go on, and he kept trying to tell me what to do. Yes, and, and I uh, thought, who is this kid? How and why dare is he, he telling me what to do? Yeah. Well, uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, but that festered inside our souls for, for a long a time. There was uh, so our souls were crying out for something, <laughs> <laughs> for something different. Yeah, and uh, I've I've really enjoyed. Like, I've known you. We've known each other for a long time because, you know, we're Toronto celebrities. Uh, and uh, But I've really enjoyed getting to know you for reals uh, the last couple of years. And, sure and um, such an admirer. I, I, you're such a very fine person, but you're also a very good broadcaster. And, and as a guy who's a fan of the game, you know, how people can, you know, I, I, I noticed uh, that. And, and as a student of that discipline i'm always impressed by how good you are at it well thank you and uh, right back at you uh, i i feel the same things now let's what so here's what i would tell you I, I i had a conversation with a golf instructor this morning on my other podcast swing thoughts and i said to him you know i have this joke i i said to my ex-wife if i'd ever thought of anything in life as much as i did my golf swing or golf mm. we'd be way richer or i would have cured something right there there's a lot of people and and you 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 your introduction was perfect because I think of golf in a spiritual way. There, it has all the hallmarks of a religion. It has its deities. It has its acolytes. It has its followers. It has its tenants. It has a a foundation. There's a cultural zeitgeist. I've played golf in many different parts of the world, and instantly when I meet another golfer, it's like meeting another scientologist or it's like meeting another. It's like meeting another mishpucha. Right. Sorry, Mike. That's a family. Some, it's family, family because. We, we have such a shared, not only a language, uh, we, there's a, a shared, there's a shared inner struggle. It's, golf brings out all these emotions. There's a lot of self-worth wrapped up in the game that doesn't happen in other games. So is it a bit of a test of character? Like, you know, uh, one of the, are one you of the, up to competing with yourself? Yeah, well, that's what it is. It's, there's a, a lot of, uh, one of the sayings in golf that I, I like is that golf doesn't, build character reveals character i think it does both but within a very short period of time when i meet another golfer i just came back from five days i was hosting a club link tournament in florida and i played with some older fellas one was 70 one was 65 another one was 35 but all four of us played five rounds of golf together we were on a little bit of a team and instantly even though i didn't know them very well we have a shared such a commonality it's like when you meet another, you know, somebody of your religion. Right. Wherever it is in the world, there's a, what is that? There's a word, beshert? Is that the word? Yes, the kindred spirit. Kindred spirit. And there's a beshert around golf. And within a few holes, we're comrades in arms and we're out struggling against the forces that conspire to, <laughs> again, and it really is that. And, and I'll tell you, you know, there's a phrase that the kids use about geeking out about something. But I can geek out about golf for days. Uh, one night we were at dinner, there's 12 men and, uh, you know, these guys are drinking beer. There's a hockey game. There's a basketball game. And there was a couple guys asking me sort of some deep questions. And all of a sudden the table goes quiet. And I found myself sort of, you know, holding court in a way because what were they ask, well, just about, you know, things like how do you get over a bad shot or they, the, here's the thing. Men especially will go home after a round of golf and feel bad about themselves because their performance that day didn't measure up. They put, they put all of their heart and soul into this discipline and they just can't seem to solve it. But in a way, it's sort of what attracts me to it is it's the unsolvable puzzle. Mm. No matter how much you try, no matter how much you want it, golf doesn't owe you anything. And it's a lot like life that way, which is why it's such a passion of mine because... Because I don't think it's about revealing character or not. What I think it is, and I thought about our conversation today, everyone hides part of their true self from other people. It's just how human beings are. We don't, you know, we, we, we're as authentic as we're, we allow ourselves to be. But what golf does, it's hard to try, it's hard, it's almost impossible to hide your true self. Mm. If you're a, a powder, if you're a, uh, you get mad easily, you know, I know this is a long answer to your question, but that's what it is. It, it's, it's, there's a passion amongst golfers, myself especially, as you can hear, that's different than other sports. All right, so I get that. In terms of spiritual journeys, there's that other element that things 
the transcendent part, the part that's not about, you know, which golf club am I going to buy? It's, it's about mind. About well, there's a woman named uh, Ellen Langer, Dr. Ellen Langer from uh, Harvard. And, and she's a, a, a real pioneer a psychologist. She's probably in her late 60s, early 70s now. And I had a chance to talk to her in the context of golf. And, and her thing all, is all about mindfulness. Mm. And what golf demands from you is to be ever present. Right. And so it's not about what club you hit or what shot you're going to play. It's about how present are you in this moment? And she talks, one of the things she said to me in this interview, she said, if you ever want to be, if you want to increase your mindfulness, whether it's golf or in life, all you have to do in this little trick is just notice one new thing. You know, I've walked into this basement where Mike, uh, Toronto Mike records his podcast. I've been here half a dozen times. So it sort of becomes routine and, and, and I, I don't really look around anymore. But the activity of noticing, if you notice something, you become instantly, you know, in this spot. So it's, it's not like I've been on the seventh hole of this golf course a hundred times. It's in this moment at this time in this, in, in this, this moment, in this shot, where am I? And, and you know, there's a, there's a, there's a thing about men, especially that, that, ha, that we have generally trouble expressing ourselves at an emotional level, but golf, it's funny. I've seen grown men act like I was like children. I was the worst you know, in my 30s, I was a highly skilled player <clears throat> with a horrible attitude. And I, I was wondering, why can't I ever break through? And then I read a book by a guy named Dr. Bob Rotella, uh, sports psychologist, first one I ever read. And it's called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. And what I got from that is that, and just like life, it wasn't about being perfect. It was about being present. And so that for the last 25 years has been what I've focused on in terms of the game of golf and how I can take lessons from it and apply it to the rest of my life. Okay. So that first half of your life where you say you were, you had all the skills, but you had a horrible attitude. The worst I ever met. So tell me, what does that look like having a horrible attitude? The reason I hesitate is I have so many examples of, <laughs> of uh, honestly, whether like we call it, you know, being a golf powder, you know, it's like you have a bad shot and then the day is over. I'll give me a, a quick example from a, a buddy I play with once in a while. And he's one of those people that it will start off. Okay. You know, make a couple of pars, do well in the first few holes. But as soon as he has um, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of pressure, this is what he always says. He goes, well, there goes the day. Hmm. And I said to him, how do you know that the next hole won't be the beginning of the best stretch that you've ever played? But if you close yourself to that possibility, it's a guarantee it won't happen. And those are the things that happen in this silly game that come up that you can see that have a parallel. We all know people like that. We all know people that say, oh, man, I want to lose weight. I want to quit smoking. I want to quit drinking. And as soon as there's a little bit of, you know, a little yeah. bump, they stop. I go, oh, I gave it a shot. But golf kind of helps you learn that as long as you keep trying, you never know something great will happen. And so for me in my thirties, I was a very high, I, I've, I've been playing since I was a kid. My dad was, you know, that's another thing about the game. It's a real, there's a real father, there's a real family aspect. Right. In my case, my dad passed away 13 years ago, almost from the time I was 17 till he died. Literally the week of his death, we were still having conversations about the golf swing and the Ooh. golf game. It, it's what attached me to him in, in such a, <clears throat> excuse me, in such a, um, well, imagine the commonality of the game and then having your father, the man who taught you. Yeah. My dad was uh, in the hospital a few days before he died and we were literally talking about his backswing. And I said to him, you know, you sh you, how, how you still care, but he did. He was like, I'm just taking it back a little too quickly. Are you? Are you really Lou? <laughs> so I was the worst. I, I would give up. I would pout. I would sulk. I'd be immature. I'd throw clubs. I'd break clubs. Right, right. And, uh, You're like the tennis guy who throws just, his Just freak out all the time. Right. And, um, and I just couldn't get over it. Like a lot of things in my life, in my 30s, 40s, early 40s, I just couldn't figure out. I knew there was something I was missing. And what I was missing was the spiritual part of it. Well, so, so there's the interesting thing in the spiritual journey. Often the issue is ego. The ego gets in the way of you being available to the present moment and being available to what it could be greater than you. Right. That's a, one of the tenets of spirituality is 
to evolve out of the sense of everything comes from ego because that ego then becomes quite quite easy to wound it it it, it just is always out there waiting for someone to kick it but if you start to take within you that idea of presence and the idea of generosity of and, spirits, and gratitude right the gratitude that you're that and, and the generosity is that moment you had with that guy it was like how do you know how do you know that the next hole is not going to be the beginning of a great stretch of golf for you to being able to just send that out to somebody and not well i think i've got him now he's in his own head and i think i'm going to win this game so there, there are spiritual aspects the other part is interesting you brought up your dad because I'm thinking to myself, a, a big part of any religious life is community. You know, I had a guy, he was uh, the president of the synagogue uh, the year before, and I was running a workshop on spiritual direction. And he said, you know, I don't believe in God. Uh, and prayer doesn't mean a thing to me. I have no idea what I'm doing when I'm standing up doing that stuff. And I said, Joel, you were the president of the synagogue. You were here every Saturday. Like, why? And he said, Ralph, I'm not being glib. I believe in Kiddush. I believe in the meal after the synagogue service is over on a Saturday because we all get to hang out together and I get to see people's kids grow up and I get to be part of family. Does golf have family? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, a hundred percent. You know, it, there's a real, even if it's not your actual family, there's a real uh, link that golfers have because the game demands that you are are comfortable with struggle. You know the first day, the first uh, line of Buddhism, I believe, is life is struggle. Life's life's hard. Life is suffering. Life is suffering. Of course, the Jews would know that. <laughs> <laughs> life is suffering. Once you get comfortable with, we just that, say. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have so, Jews have so many noises for suffering. Yeah. So golf is like that. And in the, in my early stages, I didn't, I couldn't accept it because it's also attracts perfectionists yeah. and it's the worst when you, when you want to perfect it. But in actual fact, there is no perfecting it. You know, one of the greatest players that Canada ever produced was a guy named George Newton. And one of the yeah. things he's famous for saying is you have to give up control to gain control. And most of us can't do that. One of the reasons, you know, you talk about ego how do we look? And, you know, what's this guy think of me? And what does she think of my, well, what if I, if I make a double bogey, is, am I a bad person? If I make a birdie, am I a good person? And it's all wrapped up in that. You know, one of the things that golfers struggle with is they call, you know, the first tee jitters and it's all ego. Like I, I have to tee off in front of other people. Right. What will they think? And I used to tell people, no one is watching you. You know why? Because they're thinking about their shot. Yeah. But you know what? Here's something from our tradition. Uh, you need 10 people to start a service, a minion, right? Right. I always notice, I walk my dog in Hamilton through a place that has a golf public golf course in it, right in the middle of the trail, the Shadok Trail. And there's four people, one who's going to swing and three who are watching. And without Bearing those, witness. Right, bearing witness. So if they're not there, do you feel completely different? When you go out to just drive balls by yourself, do you feel completely different? Um... Well, there's a couple things there. You know, you, you don't need four people, uh, unlike, a, you know, uh, unlike a, a Jewish service where you need 10 bar mitzvah boys. Right. Are we still doing that, by the way? Uh, it's egalitarian and it's not, a, yeah, because <laughs> 10 people. Because now, is it you ten, know, when you I know was a boy. The, the conversation now is whether or not you can have people virtually join you and can, and, and still count? And have them part of I love a, a minion. Yeah, no, we're moving on. So, uh, yeah, golf, you know, you can, the great thing about the game for me is that you can still be challenged by it, by yourself playing it. There's a, a sort of a, I find it a, I find it like you're communing with the game when right. you're doing it on your own. And then when other people are there, it has a different vibe too, because, it, because of what I said, you're, you're always a little bit like, yeah. what are they going to think? Well, and, it's the same thing when you go into a synagogue and uh, you don't know when you should stand up or sit down. What are people going to think? I don't go into a church because I don't know the rules. And right. everyone's going to look at me and go, clearly not one of ours. Well, right? this, this you'll, I think you'll connect with this because we both do stand-up or have done stand-up. I'm doing stand-up tonight, tomorrow night, you know. Excellent. And stand-up is theoretical until you're doing it. Yeah. You know, that's why I tell people who have never done it. I said, it's all fun and well, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, you're having a chit-chat about it. You know, like you can talk about your backswing or what you might try when you get to the golf course. But when you get to the stage tonight, mm. 
and you have to walk up and it's like, well, now I, now what, how, how present can I be? And how, because un- when they laugh good, when I, they don't laugh bad, you know, one of the things I learned as I got older as a comic that it really only matters if I think it's funny. It's hard to do that because you might go, wow, I really think that's funny. And then people tell you it's not, but do you still think, do I do I think I heard well, you this, have to believe you it. have to believe it. And, I, and I, I'm not sure if this was Chappelle or Louis C.K. said, if it's true, it doesn't matter mm. if you think it's funny because it's still true. Right. True for me. Golf is one of those things where you're on the range your buddies are there. We're having a great time. And every day there's no one more hopeful. I made this joke this week. Nothing more hopeful than golfers before the round. Right. Because the day holds limitless possibilities. And that first swing, though, is now it counts. So we're on the range, we're warming up, things feel great. And, they, and there's another, I have a thousand saying in golf. The longest walk in golf is, from the, is, is to the first tee. Taking your game from the range, the theoretical, to now it counts. And people always say, well, why is that? And I say, because unlike high-level amateurs and pros who practice with consequence, your first shot of consequence is about to happen now. And it feels completely different. Right. That's why we both know uh, lots of people that are way funnier than us at a party and they kibitz around, but we know that we know the magic trick. We right, know the right. technique of it. You know, I, I, I can make craft. A, it's a craft. And most people don't get that. They go, Oh, buddy's funny. You should be a comic. Yeah, yeah you should. After a thousand sets, when you know how to wait yeah. for the laugh. But if he and, says goldfish instead of car- <laughs> carp, <laughs> yeah, he's exactly. not funny. They yet. don't know. Why is that? F- we just, and so that's another thing about the game that's so attractive to me because it's parallel to a lot of other things I do, which is put yourself out there. Give yourself some, you know, are you willing to be exposed? So let me ask you something. You're a man of faith, of golf faith. Are there things you've had to sacrifice because of that faith? Well, as I said to you, you know, if I had put my attention and my compulsive attention on something. I, I honestly could have solved some, some issues, I yeah. think. I think I've sacrificed, you know, to me it didn't seem like a sacrifice, but I know that I've sacrificed some relationships. I, you know, when I met my uh, current, I was, I want, I, I, I'm going to be 60 in two months. I have to come up with a new name for girlfriend. I can't do girlfriend. Partner. I don't like partner. We're not in business together. Um, I, I've been working on this joke about how I want to call her. I want to introduce her to people as my lover because nothing makes people gag more than a grandfather going, is grandpa coming? Is Zeta coming with his lover? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, I, you know, as I said to her when I first met her, I said, oh, you know, I just want you to know I, I, I golf quite a bit. She goes, oh, my brother golfs. I go, no, he doesn't. Oh, no, no, he plays once in a while. And a few months later, I was in a, the tailor-made laboratory where they were outfitting me for some new clubs. And I was covered in head to toe in diodes and lights and they were monitoring my swing. And there was a, a cartoon version of me on a computer screen. And I said, can you take a picture of this? Cause I want to send it to this new woman I'm seeing. And I said, this is golf. Oh my! Like it was crazy. And she's like, Oh my God, I had no idea. So yeah, I, I've sacrificed to me. It's not it, because I love it so much. It's such a deep level that it's what I, you know, what's what, it's what I hope to be thinking about, like my father, until the l- couple of days before I'm done. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Lou. Lou. And, and you. Yeah. And Judaism. Uh-oh. So <laughs> how, how close, uh, tell me, what is your relationship, what has your relationship to Judaism been over the years? Well, my parents were fairly observant, even though our synagogue in Moose Jaw was reform-ish. You know, we had a rabbi in Moose Jaw. There was a couple hundred uh, members of the congregation when I was born, by the time I was bar mitzvahed, I think there was only maybe 25 or 30, and I was the last, I'm the last man. Wow. Bar mitzvahed in Moose Jaw. They turned it into a dance studio, mm-hmm. as you do. <laughs> um, so I was, I was sort of brought up in the religion, but I got to be honest with you, it was a source of some shame for me. I look back at that, you know, those times in Moose Jaw in the 60s, having to do the Lord's Prayer and being the only Jewish kid I knew. You know, you grew up in Winnipeg? No, I grew up in Toronto. Toronto. Um, but even in Winnipeg, where my mom and dad are yeah, from. a lot more. A lot more Jews. So I always felt a little bit, you know, out of step with the, you know, society I was in. And when I say there was a, an element of shame to it, because I just didn't know anybody else except my brothers and my parents and a few cousins that were Jewish. And so being Jewish in Moose Jaw, 
you know, I used to do the joke about you could always tell our house around Christmas time because it was like lights, 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 Jews, <laughs> lights, 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 you know. Um, and so I think I my relationship was a, one of a little bit of embarrassment. And like you're a, when you're a 10 year old kid, all you know is no one's like you except your family. I was bar mitzvahed. And then after that, I sort of drifted away. Although, you know, I, I've always related to it from an intellectual level because I'm fascinated by all religion and somehow luck conspired for me to meet the mother of my children uh, who was Jewish. And I you weren't t- looking for that. You know, she was the first Jewish girl I ever dated. Right. And my brothers didn't marry Jews, but I will tell you that I was uh, surprised by how much commonality we had just in the references. It's like the references you and I have yeah. versus somebody that doesn't have that reference. Yeah. And it was like, in fact, I'll back up. So I met a bunch of comics on the road before I moved to Toronto. Before I came to Toronto, I was working at Punchlines of Vancouver. And I did some yuck yucks out west, and then when I became a yuck yucks comic, I come I come to Toronto, and there was a uh, Lou Eisen and um, Simon Rakoff. Simon Rakoff, Howard Buzzgang, yeah. and I remember being invited one night to go somewhere with a group of guys, and I realized. They were inviting me because I was Jewish. Yeah. It was the first time that had ever happened to me huh. that I had a Jewish group of friends that all had that. So Jewishness was otherness. You were always the other. Right. Which I think, you know, for anyone in any minority religion in a country will always feel that no matter what that religion happens to be. But was there, you, you say your parents were observant. Was there, uh, were there spiritual elements that you carried with you or did you just say, Anyway, I happen to be culturally Jewish, but moving on. I, I'm, I'm sure at a subtle level when I was younger, there were some, you know, I, I felt, um, you know, I felt a kinship with other Jews just because of what I've said. But, you know, it's funny. When I met my future mother-in-law, she was a member of a golf club in Montreal and they'd never seen anyone like me. So after a couple holes, you know, I'm a very decent player she actually said this to me are you sure you're jewish (laughs) (laughs) and i love that because it's like you know i i was like well i'm a prairie jew you know we're different we're different we're hearty you know um but as far as the spirituality i will tell you that i've had more of a more of a connection with it as i've gotten older you and i've had these conversations there's something about it i feel some more i feel less um separate from it than I used to. Tell me more about that. I just feel like, you know, I, when I read of anti-Semitism, it hits me in a way it wouldn't have 20 years ago. You know, I talk about it on the humble and French show sometimes. I'm like, you know, if, if there were any other group that was, you know, the, we've had this conversation where, you know, the the leading hate crimes in the city of Toronto in 2019 were against Jews. And I said to Fred, I said, you know, any other group, you you would, you would never, that's all that you would talk about. But for some reason, and it's weird, like, I think there's a, a level of anti-Semitism that's just, you know, sort of accepted in society in a way that anti anything else wouldn't be accepted. So I, I find myself connecting to it in a way I, I never used to. So that's the cultural part of being as far as the yeah. identity. But yeah. what about the spiritual part of it? Like, I, I sometimes when I'm with you, I feel your yearning. Like, your golf is your obsession, your golf is such a big part of your life and, and your talent as a broadcaster, you know, allows you to continue to do what you're doing at a very high level. But then I just feel like there's maybe this other piece that's sort of saying, but what's the meaning of all this? Like what, why am I, you know, when Lou's talking to you about his backswing a few days before he's going to die, is that what you're going to be talking about? And do you want something else to be talking about too? You know? You know, I don't really, I don't, um, yeah, maybe there's a, a yearning for more um, in, information. Uh, I'm not saying it's no, about I, being Jewish. No, no, I know. I'm, I'm just I, saying yeah. there's a spiritual desire. For sure. Um, non-specific. Uh, when we're talking, I'm, I'm always fascinated by, you know, your, like, I, I, I love the, the, the origin story of Ralph Ben Murg and how it's so different of where, of where you are now. You know, I was, I don't know where I, I was reading something about, I think you were. It was an or, an article that you were featured in in Hamilton when you were right. when you guys were moving there. Right. And uh, this, you know, this is after our reconnection. I was looking back at why you were moving and what you were moving into, and you know, you're talking about your experience on television and being, you know, at one point, you know, just I can use the word reviled because it was like a yeah. shit. Oh, can yeah. we swear on this thing? 
Yeah. There's like a shit storm against you. And I thought, you know, I, I, I just, I look back at those times and I think, well, you know, how do you know, you've evolved. I, and I think part of that is age. And I think part of that is curiosity. And I think maybe some of that is a real, uh, spirituality. I'm definitely, you know, more, I, when I talk about golf as a, as a spiritual uh, discipline, there's, I, that's what I read about, but it, it, even though it's golf, the game of golf, it's also so much about my life as it's evolving. Yeah. And the you've sto- done the same thing. I mean, I know I've, I've heard you say, well, there, that was bad Howard. Old Howard, I call him. Old Howard. Old Howard. This is new Howard. The old Howard still comes up sometimes. Of course. That's what I mean. There's no All such, right. Easy. Enough. There's no <laughs> such thing as, as getting rid of yourself. No. There's just deciding on which parts of yourself you want to cultivate. Right? What part of the garden are you going to grow? The part that's the shit storm or the yeah. part that's the, you know, the love storm. So it, it's clear you're moving towards the, the love storm part. But I wonder what spirituality looks like because you talk to me about it as someone who is a student of it mm-hmm. but then you talk to me about golfing the part that is spiritual to me is the presence the mindfulness do you cultivate that do you yes. meditate on a regular basis uh, a couple of years ago i read a book by uh, sam harris right 10 uh, percent happier and uh i was like oh i i could be i would like to be 10 percent happier because i was pretty unhappy right um and so, yeah, yeah, the last few years especially, have I've evolved uh, a bit more of a curiosity and, and a bit more of a, I don't know, connection with that side of me, you know, whether it's yoga or breathing. You know, we talk a lot about this in golf psych, I call it. The mental side of the game is my, and we, my golf podcast has nothing to do with golf swings. We almost never talk about technical. It's right. all mental. It's all trying to be, a, we, we have, and we have a small but dedicated group of men mainly that have a chance to express themselves about the game of golf in a way, an emotional way that they don't talk like that to other right. people very often. So even though I continue to lean on golf, it is, it has spurred in me that natural curiosity to, you know, what else is there out there? And, and for me in my thirties, golf was all about my score, the ego. I made a six, you made a seven. I mean, you know, that's what it was. But even this week when I find myself, it takes a lot to overcome yourself. And when I found myself this week starting to lean into that result-oriented Howard, I said, okay, wait. You know, there's this guy that I know from Orlando who deals with PGA Tour players, and one of the things he tells his players is eyes up, tits up, meaning keep your eyes, and keep your eyes up because right. you watch somebody's body language, and it, it, you, you can see they're down, their eyes are down, their body slumped over, they're, they're in, eating themselves from the inside out. But when your eyes are up, physiologically, it does something to you. So does it give you another layer in the rest of your life? Yes. Okay, so tell me about that layer. Well, it's a, you know, human beings are so habitual. I mean, our, it's, here's the difference. As a younger person slash golfer, it was all react, react, react. But as you get older, you're able to maybe put down the sword and, and just respond. And I find myself responding more more better, <laughs> more better. And when I do react, I go and clean the mess up, mm. you know, because yeah, I'll react from time to time. And because say, you have a bit of a distance from yourself. Because I can look back and go, okay, well, that's a little old Howard that showed up, but I'll, I'll clean it up and right. I'll, I'll continue on. And whereas, you know, I used to, I used to say, you know, well, if I miss a putt, I'm a, I'm a bad person. I'm, I'm serious. Right. I go, I right. miss this. Right. I must be shit at putting. Right. And what I've learned through a lot of therapy is that it, sometimes good putters miss putts. So, right. You know, it, it doesn't mean you're bad at putting. It just means whatever you just did to cause the ball to miss, it doesn't, it's not, it's, I, I used to take it so personally. I used to take everything so personally. And so what has happened Been is there. that golf has taught me to take it a little less personally. You know, it's it, one of the things that, you know, comes to mind when you talk about this is where there was a, a point where you crossed that bridge to me. You know, I, I knew you as, as old Howard uh, and when I was old Ralph. And, you know, when I see you now, we're a completely different conversation. Now, is part of that age, you know, uh, if you're 
late fifties golfer, you're not expecting the same thing out of yourself or therefore there's more forgiveness or is it really just the process itself keeps having to force you to come to terms with yourself? Which one? That's it. That is very, very good. That last part, <laughs> the process. And that's what we talk a lot about in the mental side of the game. If you can love the process and leave the outcome. Right. And, and to be a better person slash player for me, I can speak for other people, is I need to focus on the process every day. I need to, you know, like I'm going on stage tonight, and one of the things I think I told you this once, where, whereas I used to go on stage and I'm like, you know, watch me, I'm going to make you laugh. And now one of the things I say to myself as I'm being introduced is, remember, this isn't about you. Mm. This experience is about them. Right. And if you're here for them, here, here for them, then it'll happen. Something, you know, the outcome, listen, you and I, we just talk funny. And like Groucho said, if I keep talking long enough, something funny yeah, will exactly, come Exactly, exactly. But as you walk onto that stage, when I was in my 30s, I met you in my 20s, actually. <clears throat> um, I was just going up there for me. Watch how, watch these cool things that I know. And I killed, I, I, I super killed. killed. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now sometimes, you know, I, I make eye contact on stage in a different way than I used yeah, to. Yeah. I make it more like, um, like when I look at somebody and say, and, I, and I'll do this sometimes when I walk up, I'll say, you know, hey, how you good? I, how are you? Are people being nice to you? Because I just want, I want to get, I want them to know that I'm a nice guy. Right. Because sometimes, you know, I used to come on and I'm like, I don't look like a nice guy. I don't look like I think I do. Right. Um, remember Jim McAleese? Sure. But he's just such a great guy. Anyway, I. Um, he's teaching. He, yeah. And so what I, you know, it's funny. I reached out to him. I said, Jim, can I send you a set? I just want you to see what you think. I want some technical yeah. adjustments. And so I hadn't watched that set in a while. And I looked at it and I'm like, there are moments there where you can tell I'm really enjoying myself. And there are moments there where uh, I'm, I'm in my head. And so the goal I have as a comic and, and as a golfer and as hopefully one day is to be less in my head and more available. You know, available. And, yeah. and people vibe with me differently than they used to. They just do. So here's a spiritual element that I think might be part of you know, your backswing. There's the concept of, of uh, a non-duality, that there's no you outside of me. There's no golf club outside of hand. There's just, everything is, is, is unified. It's a, so there's a new book by Michael Pollan called uh, Change Your Mind. And he, he gets into mushrooms and acid, and he never did this stuff when he was younger. Now he's like 60, and he, he was researching this, and he was really trying to figure things out. And one of the things that psychoactive drugs do for people is they move your ego out of the way and you see the unity of everything. You get the cosmic joke, you know, the doors of perception, Aldous Huxley, all that stuff that happened back then. It's real in a sports uh, environment. It's real in every environment that this is you in something, not I am Howard and that is the golf course, and we are going to have a fight, right? It's, I am, so when you move that to an idea of what some people, like my version of what God is, is not a noun. It's not a thing, not a guy in a white suit, you know, you know with a beard. He's not Santa Claus. So, for me, it's a verb. It's an active flow of constant creative pulsing energy that makes us have children that make stars explode and then reinvent themselves from the energy of the dying star into a new star. It's all that stuff. And it's like you're saying, if you're really playing, you're in a flow of that game. If you're not, you can constantly feel the friction and the resistance. Does that make any sense? Oh, it's all, all of it's, it's, it's the, we, we, a flow is another, you know, sort of current sports psychology term, getting it, get used to be getting into the zone, right, but it's being right. in flow and flow talks about process and process gives you flow. You can't, you can't, you know, I'm going to be in the flow today. It's just, it has to happen from a place of not trying right. from a place of non-resistance, you know? And again, I was with 60 other, you know, middle-aged, mostly white you know, Christians or whatever, they are, you know, the non, the goyim. And, and you can see the way some people 
in their 50s, 60s, even into their 70s are still at war with the world. They're just always yeah. itching for a fight and, and the airport's a, a place of constant, you know, whatever. And, I, and I'm like, that's just a story. And I, and I learned that through my, through the reading of golf and, and the things, and I'm not talking, I, again, the things I read are, are books by people who talk about mindfulness and being present and breathing and all. And that's, that's what I'm interested in. And I can see it in the world that what you said about has the, has the pursuit of this helped me in the, in the real world. Yeah. Well, I'm at the airport last night. Everyone's you know pissed off. And when is the West jet person going to get there? And this thing isn't open. And I'm just kind of like, I'm here. And, and everyone's um, uh, sort of scowling. And I get up to the counter. This is true. And I'd already checked one bag online. And I just decided, I thought, well, I've already checked it. For 30 bucks, I'll check this one too. So I want to struggle with the carry on. I said to the young woman, I said, um, how much for, uh, you know, how much to check one more bag? She goes, don't worry about it. And the guy beside me is like, how does that happen to you? I said, because cause I'm not scowling at her. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not here pissed off. I'm in a mode of... Hello, here's how I start the conversation. Hello, nice person. <laughs> and that always takes people, it disarms people. Yeah. Because you can't argue with that. I'm not calling, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just seeing that you, I'm seeing you in a positive way. So right away, you've just kind of relax around me. Whereas before, I didn't know that. I, I thought yeah. I was charming for my own sake. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like there's yeah, a difference yeah, yeah. between kibitzing or as my girlfriend calls it kibbutzing oops <laughs> it's my favorite it's like hummus yeah she, it's not she, hummus she, it's hummus i know she's like i'm just kibbutzing around i go are you <laughs> even though her name is rachel she's not jewish yeah but she wants to be she wants to be so i said to her the difference is i used to be like hey watch me con these people or i joke with the girl at the cash or the guy at the restaurant and i said i used to do it for me now i do it for them i literally want to have an interaction with them right. that stops it from just being another rote situation where everyone's pissed and everyone's so. Well, it's a resistance to being, to isness. Like if you're in a, a traffic jam, right. You have to accept that you are the traffic jam. It wouldn't be happening without you. It really needs your attendance to be a traffic jam. I, As opposed to <sighs> uh, I'm going in the HOV lane and hope I don't get busted because I don't deserve to be with these people. I deserve to be ahead of these people. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve to lose this golf game. I deserve to be winning this golf game. You know, it's that entitlement that can get in your way. I, I learned a couple of years ago, I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the effort I put into <laughs> golf and it was bugging me. That's Ralph coughing. Sorry. That's all right. I was thinking about, you know, I'm putting all this effort and I deserve more than I'm getting out of it. And then I had this thought after reading uh, The Four Agreements. Right. Which I, I've, I've written a series of essays just for myself uh, as sort of a parody of that called The Four Agreements, F-O-R-E. Yeah, right, right. And, and I've thought about it in a way that it's, it's true. Golf doesn't owe me anything. All, all it demands is that you do your best. It's almost, so, it's almost childlike. You do your best. And that's all like, you know, that's one of the disciplines. Just do your best. It's interesting because in religion, God doesn't owe you anything. You see, those who petition but the thing for is, prayer nobody is owes that traffic jam. Right. Those people don't owe, no one owes you anything. The people at the West check counter don't, don't owe you that, anything. That, and, and, and it was interesting because I was the last person to check in and she gave me the bags for free. You know, I wasn't, right. but I wasn't doing it. And you'll get this. I wasn't schnoring her. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't trying to con her. I was just there for her, just for a funny little moment. I find some of my best uh, uh, presence moments are in airports because, uh, first of all, uh, when you listen to Brian Eno's music for airports, if they just played that in every <laughs> airport, everybody would just chill out. But the anxiety, the tension, the I'm not going to get, the moment that they start to board a flight where there's still... 75% of the people who aren't ready to be boarded are standing there. And I'm like, you're rushing to get into a cramped bus with wings? Just be here. Let's relax. Let me ask you about, Rachel wants to be Jewish. Do you want, is it important for you that she become Jewish? No. No. So uh, when you think of your own Judaism, do you just think, and the buck stops here? I, I'm not, I, I don't care if my kids do it. I don't care if my partner do it. Does um, it. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm not it anymore. I don't really, you know, I, I think about Judaism m more recently, culturally, um, than I do religiously. Although that being said, we still, my ex-wife and I are still best friends. We still get the, get together for the Jewish holidays. I'm still invited 
to her mother's for Seder. I'm still, so you have that angle. I have it. You know, like but I'm you there. don't do synagogue shopping. You don't look around. And go well, maybe I can try this one. Uh, I was in a synagogue recently. I was telling was to tell you about doing stand up in a synagogue. I've done a few shows in synagogues, which is weird because you you know like that. There's a perfect example about my connection to Judaism is I walked out in front of 250 people supposed to do 20 minutes working with a very funny comic from LA named Kathy Ladman. Do you remember her? Yeah, I think was like, she'd, you'd know her. So she's like our age. Oh, I think so. It was on yeah, curb, yeah, yeah, all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Very funny woman. But I got to get up. I got to do 20 minutes. So I'm thinking about what to do. And I, I got up and for the first few minutes, I just, have all these references. At one point I was doing Dianu, the next thing and I was doing something about the four questions and on and on in a way that I could never do. I didn't have to explain any of those references. At one point I just yelled Maror and they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Takia, I was a like, Maror. And, and, and I, uh, I was like, wow, this is a weird experience. Again, having said, I've felt always distant and out yeah. of, and all of a sudden here I'm in a room full of people and an older crowd too. Um, Couple hundred and fifty people, some with keepers, some not, and um, I just it was a it was a fun it was an interesting feeling for me. I thought you know this is a pretty good place. Hmm. So you going to do anything about that? What are you? What are you? I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe one day you're I'll uncomfortable go. right no, now. No, no, because I, no, I, I don't I have an answer for you. Well, oh, that's interesting too. I don't As know if I'm going to... As opposed to, oh, no, 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 or, no. yeah, absolutely. It's somewhere, yeah. So I'm, there's some rumination going on yeah, in there. Yeah, I think about it. My youngest uh, daughter has uh, somehow discovered Judaism in a weird way. You know, she she's the one that drives the make. We want to have Seder. She wants to, you know, we our, our family usually is... Uh, the blessing, uh, the bread, the wine, right. a couple of questions, Diane, and all, let's eat. This last one, you know, we had to... the full roar? Not the full, but more than we used to when we were when they were kids. Yeah. So that was interesting. Did um, you? Uh, how did you feel when that was going on? Because that's an expansion as opposed to a yeah. contraction. Um, I felt for her, if that's what she wants to explore, then she should. My ex-wife is definitely more observant. Uh, her family still, you know, does all the holidays, goes to synagogue. They fast. Right. So you've done some shows in synagogues, but there's nothing in you that makes you think, I'm going to go on a Saturday and see what this feels no. like. No, I, I get that. I get that. So when it comes to the bigger questions, as we get older, you know, where, where are we going? Why are we here? What, what the hell just happened? It's still, and I'm not saying this like I don't believe it. It, it seems to me that golf has given you a lot of really good answers. It's really made you have to come to terms yeah. with yourself and really become, do I want to be that guy? Yep. Do I want to be the next guy? You know, it was, it was, uh, it was the exploration of trying to curb my own. It was, at first I thought it was about getting better as a player, mm. but it was about getting better as a person. I know this sounds hokey, but I used to go golfing with people. And if I was playing well, it would be a pleasant experience for them. If I wasn't, it would be a very unpleasant, awkward experience. I literally have walked off golf courses many, many times. When wow. I was in my 30s, I would be, we'd be playing all of a sudden, you know, screw this, I'm going home. And uh, it really was that first book of many, many, many books that got me to think that maybe there was a different way for me to behave. And maybe, and I had other people, I've had people say this to me, you know, hey, don't, like I was being a dick one day playing golf and this older guy, uh, probably in my late 30s. He might have been in his 50s. And he liked me. So he pulled me aside and said, you know, just remember this isn't about you today because we were hosting some client, potential clients. And he said, you remember, this is about them. I was like, what? This could be about some, this is about somebody other than what I just I got to replace a divot. <laughs> I'm busy. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, this is about somebody beside me. And so I think in a way like- Who the this, fuck? Is- <laughs> what? Yeah. But, but so- my spirituality, even though it seems odd, has is rooted in this game that's 450 years old. And as you began in the introduction, you know, it has all of the hallmarks. And it's interesting that you started that because I started thinking about you a couple of days ago. And I thought, he'll find that, he'll get that. Mm. And, it, and you did without even me bringing it up, mm. that it has all the trappings or the dis- distinguishing marks of religion, especially for me. So who... When you when you think of who are the um, 
the deities of, of your particular religion? Well, it starts they? with Tom Morris, who was uh, one of the original Scottish. He's the one of him, old Tom and young Tom. Uh, these are some of the late 1800s. They uh, started St. Andrews, or they were there at the beginning of the royal and ancient. But the big ones in the modern era, Bobby Jones, Byron Nelson, Ben Hogan, and that was sort of the the beginning of the professional game. And then Arnold Palmer is, you know, on the Mount Rushmore would be Palmer, Nicholas, and then this kid, Tiger Woods, who created such a, a paradigm shift in the game to basically, it, it he took it from where it was, Nicholas and Palmer and those guys, Gary Player, Lee Trevino, and he he, he yeah. sort of ushered in the, the modern era that we're in now. Um, but tell, there, tell me his journey for you when you watch somebody like that because I, I'm fascinated. Well, by he's his the, he's life. Jesus, by the way. That's what so I call that him. I call him Black say, Jesus. Yeah, I have been calling him that for years because he was the anointed one. No, no, no one ever thought there'd be anyone uh, to replace Jack Nicholas, and then all of a sudden, this guy came along. And you know, there's a famous uh, quote: Nicholas, uh, Bobby Jones, when he saw Nicholas as a young man who was a very powerful, big, thick, you know, strong guy from. Uh, um, Ohio and Bobby Jones famously said he plays a golf he plays a game of which I'm not familiar. Mm. And when Tiger came along, Nicholas passed the torch by saying right. similarly, right. I can't relate to that anymore. And so Tiger for me, again back to my father, my father would call me almost every Sunday that Tiger played in one. And we would talk about what we had just seen. And it always began with, uh, hey, it's a pretty good day for your guy. Because I, I was a Tiger fan the way that Toronto Mike and Fred are Leaf fans. Right. And it was pretty good times for me. And then, of course, he has this amazing ascension. No one's ever seen anything like it. Nobody. I mean, I'm, I, I could give you some statistics that are mind-blowing. Up till Tiger Woods, I think Jack Nicholas in his best year, may have won four or five times. Tiger had six or seven years where he won eight, nine, ten times. Wow. It was ridiculous. He won the Masters for the first time by 12 shots over grown men that were like, what is this? <laughs> and it's a black kid. Yeah. You know, the iconic um, moment at the Masters in 97 is Tiger Woods coming up the 18th hole. He's, he's going to win the Masters by 12 shots. He's still grinding it out because he knows it. He's a historian. He knows the record at, the, at Augusta. He's got to make a par in the last hole. And he's, he's really trying on that last shot. But the, the iconic picture is of all the, the staff at this golf course, all black, the, the yeah. waiters, the, those clubhouse guys, all, those, all these guys yeah. watching this black kid walk up the fairway. It's amazing. And then, of course, Tiger's fall from grace. You know, Tiger... How did you feel when, when that news broke? Conflicted because it's like, I still love the guy, but now everything in society is like, oh, he's this and that. And again, it's a great lesson in, you know, just how people love to, you know, shit on other people because as though they've never done anything wrong themselves. But the resurrection of Tiger, this is what I love, is and comes back in the in the in December of 2017. He hasn't played in very regularly for four or five years, back issues and health. Yeah. And he, at one point, didn't think he would ever play again, or he just wanted to get well enough to play with his children. In December of 2017, he is. Oh, another thing, he was ranked. Just Greg Norman was uh, the the man before Tiger Woods. He was number one in the world for a total of about 300 or so weeks. Is that, yeah, 300 weeks over the course of, you know, a few years. Tiger was number one in the world for 12 years. Like, it was unheard of. So then he falls to 1,000 and uh, let's say 1,100th in the world in December of 2017. And then he comes back. And by the spring of last year when he won the Masters, he's all the way back to number six in the world. So seeing that was also like the resurrection. Right. And it's funny because Rachel was at my house on uh, the Sunday of the Masters this year in 2019. And they had to move the tee times up from the traditional late Sunday afternoon. They had to move them up because there was going to be some weather. So now it's on at 8.30 in the morning when it would normally be on at 3. So she's leaving the house and uh, she says, you know, good luck today. <laughs> and I said, I just want you to know that if he wins today, I will be crying. Right. And I was. Right. I I'm going to tell you, and I'll know, I know a lot of men that were tearing up when right. Tiger Woods won the Masters, because it was like you couldn't have ever imagined that that was going to happen two years prior. He he wasn't even playing, so yeah, he's it's again you know back to the religious analogy, the metaphor. It has all that for me. 
Like, imagine that. I'm a you know, 59-year-old man tearing up right. because this guy that I idol- have idolized for since 19, prior to 97, I knew this kid watching him win the U.S. Amateur, U.S. Junior Amateur, then the U.S. Amateur. Like, he has been a phenomenon in that sport Did he forever. disappoint you when, when, he, when he fell, when his wife was putting a golf listen, driver through the windshield? Did, did, listen, we've all... We've all had our right. So he, <laughs> he, he, he it, yeah. so he, you know, on you the can surface, parallel, I have to pretend. With, oh, tiger! Par- but you can parallel yeah. in whatever ways, not in the actual events, but that ego life, that egoic life and struggle, which gets him to a point where he's just all over the place underneath that surface of perfectness. You know, where he's, you know, just having affairs and going crazy and. You know, texting people right behind his wife's back. He's got two children. But then I always wonder, because he's never been the same guy again. No. Nope. Right? Those press conferences when he was at his height were, you know, I'll do you the favor of about 14 right. seconds and I'm out of here. He'd say things like, uh, I don't care uh, I don't care about anything but winning. Second place is for losers. Right. Uh, and he was the worst, in fact. You know, that was one of the things I used to joke about. Worst press, worst interview ever. But lately, I say the last three or four years, he's changed because he's now Absolutely. gone from being a kid and the height of the world to. But he being, has a humility that can only come with yeah, a fall from a, grace, a, a, which a, is a spiritual exactly. experience. You right? know what, Ralph? That's so true. He is a different person. He's more available. Yeah. He he does more things. grateful for winning. He, and you know, I, I, let's talk about gratitude. You know, it's one of the things that I have. That, that certainly helped me. You know, my attitude changed because I have gratitude around that game and others. He is uh, much different. He's got, he's got a, cause he knew he, he, he almost lost the, this thing he was m- the greatest in the world at, and he got a little bit of it back. And this new tiger, the last 24 months tiger is a different guy, just like we all are in right. our early forties. And it's kind of been interesting to watch him. And you know what? It could be, this could be the end of that run and he might be around for a little while longer. We're never going to see, I won't live to see another, you know, Babe Ruth, Gretzky, Tiger. They're all special. They don't come around very often. You know, when I lived in Calgary, I remember I wasn't a flame fan. I was working at a radio station. So you're sort of a flames fan cause you're on the radio. Right. But I remember going to games and uh, this is 81, 82, 83 and flames fans go oh, Gretzky. He's overrated. I go, do you know what you're seeing? The guy had 212 points last year. <laughs> do you understand this is not going to happen? Just enjoy this because right. this is, I know he's, well, there are arch rivals, <laughs> But it's Wayne Gretzky. And that's the same one where people go, oh, Tiger Woods, blah, blah, blah. They're always following him no matter what he does. I go, you're seeing yeah. Picasso. Right. You're getting to watch this be created. And, uh, and so it gives me a lot of satisfaction. I get a lot from golf. You know, I've got, you know, I, before I came here today, I put on the PVR so I could take tape Tiger's playing in this uh, little fun tournament he puts on every year before they go to the uh, President's Cup in Australia. Well, I'll go home later and watch it. So if there's an afterlife, which golf course would you want to be on? Well, I think the, uh, you know, sort of the standard golfer answer would be something like Pebble Beach or St. Andrews. But, you know, it's weird. The golf course I grew up on in Moose Jaw. Mm. You know, it's kind of like where it began, where I fell in love with it. And even though it's a lot in much better shape than it was when I was a kid, where it was just basically some brownish dirt <laughs> and uh you know not in but it, it to me it's 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 i will always remember that because i remember looking at my dad's and his friends and then i worked there as a kid i worked in the pro shop and i it's where i learned to i learned a little bit about how to act with people right and my dad came to, i was cleaning clubs and i wasn't making very much money but i got to play for free and my father came off the golf course one day i was eating a plate of fries and he knew i don't have any money he said where'd you get that from i said well you know you know, Gladys or whatever gave to me. He goes, really? I said, yeah, she's just cause I, could I, but I, cause I was nice to her. And I learned that if you were nice to people, they'll give you stuff. Right. You know, sometimes again, and when I was younger, I did it cause I went, I was like uh, the music man. I could me. con it. Yeah. I was, I learned that you could con people if you were kind of charming to them. And that's how I played the game for a long time. And then I switched at some point to going, well, I want to be like this. And if you, if it's pleasant for you, then great. We all win. Right. Cause it's, it's like I do this uh, thing when I sometimes when I'm emceeing, I'll say, you know, instead of just saying tip your waitress, I say, listen, how many people, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever worked in the service industry, but I'll tell you, serving people in a comedy club isn't easy. 
And let's give our staff a round of applause. And then I always say, listen, if you're with somebody and they're ever shitty to waiters or waitresses or sort of people, you can't be their friend. And I say that always resonates with people that go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because we've all been with people that treat those people like well, shit. Well, you're taking the side of the, of the person who's, you know, going to get the tip. And it's, it's the kind of empathy that's required in a spiritual life. You, you have to have empathy and compassion. And you have to be able to see that you are part of everything and everything is affected by what you do. So when Howard gets up there and does stand up and he's just killing, <laughs> then that's great for Howard. But yeah. if you're connecting to the person, like you said, where you actually give my contact, then you have, uh, then you have congregation. You know, I think I, I think I shared this once when you and I were having breakfast and I said, you know, I've started saying this sometimes at the end of the night. Just before I say goodnight, I read the announcements. And this is downtown at Yuck Yucks, 300 people. I said, and I, it, it was so weird the first time I said it, it, it was almost like I almost choked on the words. I, not that I got emotional, but I didn't, it felt so weird to say this. And I said, you know what? It wouldn't be such a bad thing if, you were, if we were all a little nicer to each other. I think I said words to that effect. Maybe not as clumsy, but that's what my sentiment was. And it was weird. From a whole lifetime of going, all right, fuckers, what's going on? All of a sudden, I'm saying, you know what? It wouldn't be a bad thing if we were all a little nicer. Good night, everybody. And it's almost like, what? Yeah. And then I walk off. Yeah, I, I, I always end with take care of each other as opposed to take care of yourself. But it's a weird thing to say, especially for me. Oh, I mean, I don't know. No, it's good. You know, it's it's connecting to the heart, not 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 your crotch and not your brain, but right. your heart, right? There's four worlds that we live in, right? The, the body, the heart the mind and the spirit. And it's a question of how much time you spend in each of those apartments. You, you know, know, Groucho said that, uh, you know, what I think he said, uh, if you can fake sincerity, you know, it's it was something to that. Yeah. But it's not true. You can't fake authenticity. No. and Because people get it. They, I, I, they well, can feel stand it. stand-up's great for that because if you're not authentic, you're not funny. Right. If you're just, I thought this thing up and I'm pretty sure it's funny. It's like, it's not coming from anywhere. You know, you learn the beautiful things from people like that. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it, and I'm going to say my little blessing for you is that uh, may you be able to go to that golf course in Moose Jaw in the sky <laughs> with, your, with your dad and play an 18 holes of love uh, with that man. So uh, I, I really appreciate you I've enjoyed the you. hell out of this. I knew I would. Yeah, me too. And thanks, thanks to uh, Toronto Mike. He's a nice Toronto boy. Mike. He's a Toronto Mike, and there's this facility. Ashkenazi <laughs> Jews, by the way, the ones who are the fiddler on the roof Jews, which I'm, I'm not. I'm the North African guy. Uh, no, I'm Ashkenazi. All, all, yes, you are. And uh, there, are, uh, all the foods start with K. Kreplach, Kanish, Kugel. Kugel. Yeah, uh, k- Kishka, uh, and it's all beige. That's right. All the food is beige. That's right. So these are things you don't want in life. You go with a Moroccan like me. There's get, a little spice. Get, here's a little spice. We're the right. R&B of Judaism. And for some reason, my sweet little Randy, she only really liked the Moroccan Jews. That was one of the first things I learned about. It. <laughs> the Moroccan Jews. I'm like, in Musha, there was just us, the yeah. Jews. Well, in Israel, that's a thing. Believe me. <laughs> we didn't have fancy Jews growing yeah, up. Yeah, no, and we still don't. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank Humble you, Howard, Howard Glassman. And uh, what's your uh, uh, podcast in golf there? Uh, the podcast is called Swing Thoughts. And uh, we don't have much uh, social media. We have a Facebook page. It gets uploaded to iTunes. Like I said, it's a pretty small, dedicated group of nerds. Yeah, it's good. And I love it. And, of course, your always show. Humble and Fred Radio.com. Uh, Monday through Thursday, we're live. Monday through Saturday, you can hear us on Funny 820 and a few other Bell stations. And of course, uh, the uh, most uploaded podcast in Canadian history. Yeah, history. Uh, history. 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 <laughs> uh, I'll be at the Yuck Yucks. Well, maybe not when this one's no, on. exactly. By the uh, time you hear this, I will have either. Uh, he's been at Yuck. He's super kill. He I killed. Super killed. Super, that was Howie. Good night, ladies. Thing. Super kill. Howie always said super killed. He never just said I, I killed. He was, I super killed. I worked a, a show with Lou Eisen recently. And I oh, want to yeah. tell you, that guy is just technically so good. Yeah, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah. His thing is boxing. Well, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. It wasn't Lou. Oh. It was Simon. Oh, so, oh, Simon. Simon. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Simon. I've, worked with Lou, I've worked with Lou a couple years ago, but I worked with Simon recently. I should have Simon on the show. He's I'll tell you, he is dude. still, he's a, he's a guy that has aged well in terms of his ability to deliver material. He's so good at it. Excuse me. Like, I was on a show with a bunch of other kids. I was emceeing, and I went out and made sure I watched him mm. because it's like watching a guy that is just yeah, is so good. You seasoned. want him in a writing room. He, so good. Because he, he'll finish the joke. 
right? And it's just like, I need the thing. Yeah. I've got everything all the way to the thing. And then he'll just say it. It's Kreplach. Thank you. There's Thank the you. thing, number 17. And he would know that it goes in the right spot in the sentence. Absolutely. Which is another thing you can't really explain to Just people. like a golf swing. All yeah. right. I'm Ralph ben Murgi. This is Not That Kind of Rabbi, my podcast. And I thank you for listening. You take care of each other. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, at Ralph ben Murgi on Twitter, Ralph ben Murgi on Facebook, and uh, Ralph ben Murgi at gmail.com. Any of those ways. Love to hear what you think. Bye. This podcast has been produced by TMDS and accelerated by Rome Phone. Rome Phone brings you the most reliable virtual phone service to run your business and protect your home number from unwanted calls. Visit romephone.ca to get started.